All right, well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. I think this is a, as good a time as any to, to get started. Um, we appreciate your being here. Um, I'm Rob Menster. I'm the opinion editor at the Wasa Daily Herald. Uh, thanks to Common Cause for, for inviting me and, um, and for hosting the, the, this panel. This should be an interesting conversation. Um, this forum is organized by Common Cause in Wisconsin, uh, and it's one in a continuing series of similar forums that they've held throughout Wisconsin during the past four years, meant to bring citizens, elected officials, academics, and reform advocates with differing ideas together to discuss and exchange views about how to clean up Wisconsin's state government and politics. They've had similar forums in Green Bay, Milwaukee, La Crosse, Sturgeon Bay, Eau Claire, Janesville, Waukesha, Stevens Point, Middleton, Appleton, Madison, Kenosha, and tonight, finally, the best of all, Wausau. Uh, uh, there's others that are being planned for this year and next, uh, including one two weeks from tonight at UW Oshkosh. This evening's public forum has been co-sponsored by the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, the UW Marathon County Political Science Department, the American Association of University Women, Wausau Branch, the American Association of University Women, Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alliance for Retired Americans, the League of Women Voters, Wisconsin Education Network, the League of Women Voters of Stevens Point, the Marathon County Democratic Party, and the Republican Party of Marathon County. Common Cause in Wisconsin uh, organized the event, which is made possible by a grant from the Joyce Foundation. Uh, and now, uh, I will introduce the panelists. I'm going to do an introduction of everyone, uh, and then we'll give each panelist a chance to do, uh, give a brief sort of some opening remarks um, to, to get us started, and then we will open the floor to questions, comments, um, your thoughts. So I'm going to read these in the order that they are on my notes. Uh, State, Repres State Representative Donna Seidel is currently serving her fourth term in the Wisconsin State Assembly as Assistant Democratic Leader. She was raised in the Fox Valley and attended UW-Stevens Point and received a bachelor's in sociology. For the last 30 years, she's been a resident of Marathon County. For 16 years, prior to her State Assembly election, Representative Seidel was the Clerk of Courts in Marathon County. Earlier in her career, she served as a police officer with the Wausau Police Department. <clears throat> and later as an investigator in the district attorney's office. Currently, she serves as the assistant democratic leader and as a member of the Committee on Health, Committee on Children and Families, Committee on Assembly Organization, and Committee on Rules. Uh, very important rules. Uh, she, always, she also served on the Committee to Improve Interpreting and Translation in Wisconsin Courts since April 2006, the Children's Trust Fund of Wisconsin's Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board, since January 2005, and was recently named to the Wisconsin Women in Government's 2011 Board of Directors and Leadership Team. Representative Seidel has been involved in a variety of community groups, including the Wausau Noon Optimist Club, North Central Technical College Board of Trustees, Wisconsin Association of Clerk of Courts, United Way of Marathon County Board, the Women's Community Board of Directors, the Wausau Festival of Arts Board of Directors, and the Wausau YMCA Board of Directors. She's married to Andy Benedetto and has a daughter, Kim, a stepson, Adam, and a stepdaughter, Kara. Uh, Walter John Chilson, also here is a native of Merrill and graduated from Lawrence University in Appleton and did graduate school work at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. He had a long career in radio and television news and was the anchor of Channel 7 News in Wausau for 10 years. He was elected to the Wisconsin State Senate as a Republican in 1966 and served until 1991. He was also the Republican candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives in a special election in 1969. After his service in the legislature, legislature. Uh, Mr. Chilson served on the State Gaming Commission and has also served on the board of 1,000 Friends of Wisconsin. He is well known in the area for his work with the Neighbors Place. He is a frequent guest on the Week in Review program on Wisconsin Public Radio. Kevin Hermaning is the CEO and managing partner of the Wausau-based Hermaning Financial Group, LLC. He is a credentialed certified financial planner and certified wealth strategist. A Milwaukee native, Mr. Hermaning enlisted in the Marine Corps, was promoted to the rank of sergeant within 15 months, and served a total of 13 years on active duty and the Marine Corps reserves. He has earned the U.S. State Department's Award for Valor and the POW Medal and Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the nation's highest peacetime military decoration. He attended both the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and Stevens Point. He studied journalism at Oshkosh and business administration at Stevens Point. 
Mr. Hermaning was elected three times to the Mosny School Board and served as board president and treasurer. He has twice been a candidate for the state legislature and Congress and has been active in Republican Party politics for more than 25 years, including eight years as chairman of the Republican Party of Marathon County. From 1987 to 1991, he was the executive director of the Badgers Back in Charge, a nonprofit organization dedicated to government reform and in particular, elected official term limits. He and his wife have two daughters in college and reside in Mosinee. He is also a frequent guest on Wisconsin Public Radio's Week in Review program. Eric Giordano serves as the director of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, established in 2007 as an institute of the UW Colleges and Extension. He is also an associate professor of political science at UW Marathon County. During his tenure, the Wisconsin Institute has grown to become a statewide organization with a mission to link faculty scholarship and research, student engagement and service, and community interests and resources to address complex public issues. He has researched Hmong American political participation and the impact of deliberative processes on public policy. He's a regular political commentator on radio and television and in newspapers. Eric received his PhD and master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts, where he studied ethnic and sectarian conflict and negotiation and conflict resolution. Jay Heck has been the executive director of Common Cause in Wisconsin since 1996. Prior to taking that position, Heck served as the vice president of the Wisconsin Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, and before that, as a legislative aide for the former Wisconsin State Senate Majority Leader, Joe Stroll of Racine. He was, the, he was also the assistant director and communications director of the State Senate Democratic Caucus. Prior to moving to Wisconsin from Washington, D.C. in 1988, Jay was the legislative director for former U.S. Congressman Peter Kostmeyer of Pennsylvania from 1983 to 1988, and before that, served as a staff member for former Republican Congressman and the independent candidate for President of the United States in 1980, John B. Anderson of Illinois. Heck is a graduate of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. He has two children and resides in Madison. Common Cause in Wisconsin is the state's largest nonpartisan citizen reform advocacy organization with more than 3,000 members, including many in the greater Wausau area. Common Cause is also the main sponsor of this evening's forum. So, thanks everyone. Let's give a round of applause to the panelists. Okay, well, we're gonna do uh, opening statements. Each panelist may, will have about six to eight minutes or so um, to, to speak on some issues that are important to them. And we'll start with, uh, with Jay Heck. Jay, could you sort of set the stage for the conversation? Rob, I'm delighted to, and thank you very, very much. I'm greatly appreciative to the Wausau Daily Herald for publicizing this event. Hopefully some of you found out about it by, uh, by reading that fine newspaper. Uh, I'm grateful to the sponsors of tonight's uh, event, and most of all, I'm very grateful to all of you for showing up on a really kind of nice night out tonight, and uh, the fact that we don't have any beer here or anything else, and you still have shown up, it's such a big turnout, is, is gratifying indeed. So, uh, and tonight really is, is, is mainly about you. The purpose of, of this panel is to provide some insights and some opinions about some of these issues. Uh, but what we're really here for, and what I'm particularly interested in, is hearing from you uh, what you think and uh, what your ideas are about how to clean up Wisconsin. Uh, we've been doing this, as Rob said, uh, over the uh, last four or five years, and uh, certainly nobody knew what a tumultuous year in Wisconsin uh, 2011 would be. Uh, I remember n a number of tumultuous years. 2002 was one when we had uh, a tremendous scandal in Madison, the Legislative Caucus scandal, which brought down uh, two of the top legislative leaders, the Senate Majority Leader and the Speaker, and a number of other top leadership people. Uh, and so I'd say over the last 10, uh, 12 years, uh, it, this has been a state that has seen something that it didn't used to see, uh, and that is uh, a lot of turmoil, a lot of division, uh, and a lot of money in politics. Uh, Justice Louis Brandeis, who was a United States Supreme Court Justice in the early part of the century, once called Wisconsin the laboratory of democracy. And in fact, it was, uh, for many, many years, considered the model of state government. And by model, I mean a government where people respected their state government, uh, where issues were decided on the merits of arguments, 
not by campaign cash or the amount of money spent by outside interest groups in elections. It was a state other states wanted to emulate. And this was a reputation uh, that followed all through the uh, Walter John Chilson service in the, uh, in the Wisconsin legislature from 1966 to 1990. These were what I call in many ways the golden years of Wisconsin state government when Republicans and Democrats fought like cats and dogs on the floor of the Capitol, but at night went, on, went to the inn on the park for a beer or two, uh, resolved their differences, and came together for the people of Wisconsin. Unfortunately, uh, those days are long gone. And one of the goals that my organization has, a long-term goal, is to see if we can't somehow put the pieces back uh, to that glass that has been broken over the last dozen years or so. Wisconsin used to be, as I said, uh, a place where elections were won not by money, uh, but by issues. In 1986, Tommy Thompson, then the Republican minority leader in the, in the State House and the Assembly, defeated incumbent Governor Tony Earle of Wausau uh, in a close election where total spending, total spending by the two candidates was $2.9 million. Two candidates for statewide office for governor, $2.9 million. 24 years later, in the latest election for governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker, Tom Barrett, and the outside special interest groups combined to spend more than 10 times that amount, $37 million. We've also seen now a third state Supreme Court election in which over $6 million has been spent, most of it by outside groups with names like All Children Matter or the Greater Wisconsin Committee, but none of us know where that money comes from. It's undisclosed, it's unregulated. We had over the summer recall elections where more than $40 million was spent. The candidates were badly and overly outspent by special interest groups. Again, much of that money unregulated, undisclosed. Wisconsin was one of the first states in the country to adopt a public financing system back in the late 1970s in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal. We also now have the dubious distinction of being the first state in the country to completely repeal our public financing system. And it was a system that worked pretty well for some years till about 1986, and then the wheels came off. And special interest groups started getting involved in our politics. WEAC, uh, WMC, Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, followed by many, many other special interest groups. Many would suggest, suggest these groups do have a right to speak, and I wouldn't disagree with that, but I also think that they have a right to tell us who they are and where their money's coming from, and that's something we have increasingly haven't seen in Wisconsin politics. Our public financing system, as I said, was repealed earlier this year. It wasn't working very well, but one part of it that was working was, was a measure that passed only two years ago. It was the impartial justice bill, which, which gave candidates for the Wisconsin Supreme Court $400,000 of public money, and in return they would abide by those spending limits. The beauty of it was that David Prosser and Joanne Kloppenberg in the election this past April both spent the exact same amount of money. And if that had all been all the money that was spent, then it truly would have been a case of ideas uh, pitted against each other uh, for, uh, to see who would win. But $5 million of special interest money on both sides was spent, again, most of it undisclosed and unregulated. So disclosure is something that I think we need in Wisconsin politics. It's basic, it doesn't cost anything, and it's something that would serve all the citizens of the state if we knew who was behind much of the money that was flowing into this race. The other part of it, I think, is a revived public financing system. The Citizens United decision, which is a U.S. Supreme Court decision decided about a year and a half ago, broke a hundred years of settled law and precedent and opened up the floodgates of corporations and unions to be able to spend unlimited money trying to influence elections at the federal level and at the state level. It repealed laws that had been in place a hundred years in Wisconsin that was passed during the administration of Governor Robert La Follette and the presidency of President Theodore Roosevelt. The Supreme Court five to four said essentially that money is speech and that it can speak loudly. But the United States Supreme Court in that very same decision also voted eight to one that the federal and state governments 
ought to disclose where the money's coming from. It was almost as if they were saying on the one hand, we're sorry all this money's gonna be flowing into your elections, but at the very least, you ought to know where it's coming from. We haven't done that in Wisconsin. In 2010, when the Democrats controlled the Wisconsin legislature, the Senate Majority Leader, I don't have to tell you who that was, and the Assembly uh, Speaker, both Democrats at the time, failed to come in a, to an agreement on disclosure language, so we never got it. And it hasn't happened yet, and consequently, much more of the money that's flowing in our politics is undisclosed and unknown to you, the voters. I think that's a disservice to you. A couple of the other issues I hope we can talk about tonight are the revival of a public financing system. Uh, the reason that public financing is as important, in my view, and in view of many others, is that legislators or statewide candidates who take public financing are beholden to the public. They're not beholden to the special interest groups that now finance campaigns. And there are many special interest groups that don't contribute money just because they're promoting good government or elections or democracy. It's usually with some strings attached. Senator Michael Ellis, a conservative Republican senator from Nina, has always said that public financing is needed in Wisconsin because it acts as an insurance policy on public policy. It keeps the special interest groups from putting their claws into public policy and shaping it the way they want it shaped rather than the way it ought to be shaped to serve the needs of the people. In 2007, all seven Supreme Court justices on the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the conservatives and the liberals, all said the Wisconsin legislature needs to provide public financing because the private money pouring into special or into Supreme Court elections is lowering people's confidence in the court. I hope we can talk some about that. Two other quick things. Uh, this year earlier, uh, Wisconsin passed a photo voter ID bill. It had been something that had been in play for a number of years. That was not a surprise. What was shocking to me was that it was the most extreme, the most restrictive photo ID bill in the nation. It will be easier to vote in Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, states that traditionally put up roadblocks to voting, than it will be in Wisconsin in the next election. We can discuss and debate tonight whether it was needed or why it was needed, but if it was needed, why it had to be so extreme, I think bears some going into and some discussion. The other problem with it is that it is, uh, in my view, something that will prevent a large number of citizens from exercising their franchise because it's going to be too difficult for them or just inconvenient or, or in some cases impossible to get to a Department of Transportation motor vehicle office in some of our rural counties when some of these offices are open six days out of the year. So there's some real problems with regard to that, uh, and I hope we can get into that. And then finally, I hope that we can discuss a little bit about something that just occurred earlier this year, and that is the redistricting of our state legislative and congressional districts. You know, as recently as 1998, Wisconsin had four very competitive congressional districts. There was an, obviously a big turnover in 2010. In this district, of course, Congressman Obie retired. But had he not retired, it's hard to say whether he would have, it would have been competitive. I think it might have been. I think certainly one person here on the panel thinks it might have been very competitive. But nevertheless, uh, that was a special election. By and large, elections in Wisconsin now are less competitive because of the redistricting program or the redistricting plan that's been pushed through the legislature. And I, just so it doesn't sound as if I'm taking only one side here, I can assure you, had the Democrats been in power in the two, during the 2011 redistricting, that they also would have tried, I think, to try to make uh, their, a partisan redistricting plan put in place for, to, to benefit them. That's why it makes sense to take redistricting out of the hands of elected officials in the legislature and put it in the hands of a nonpartisan entity that draws lines, not so that they're choosing who the voters are, but so that the voters, there's some, so that elections are more competitive and that there makes some sense to have communities of interest within a legislative or congressional uh, 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 district. And I want to close by saying this. This is a great panel for me uh, to be on tonight because I really respect all the individuals up here. 
Uh, Donna Seidel has been an excellent state representative in uh, Madison. She's a hard worker. She works on many, many different issues. Walter John Chilson, as I said, uh, was a state senator in Wisconsin when Republicans and Democrats worked together for the good of the people. He is from that golden age, and I think he had a lot of good common sense and brought a lot to the table uh, and, and really tried to make Wisconsin a better place first and secondly. And then Kevin Herman, and I've got to tell you, when I was in college in the late 1970s and I went to Washington, D.C., uh, he was a hero. He was a, he was a national hero uh, for his service in, in I was going to say Afghanistan, <laughs> how long we've come, for his service in Iran uh, and has come back to Wisconsin and served this area very, very well. I've just met Eric Giordano tonight. He seems like a great guy, and we'll find out more about him. And uh, I'm grateful, I'm grateful to... <laughs> I'm grateful to, to Rob as well, but most importantly, I'm grateful to you. So thank you for coming, and I look forward really to hearing from you. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll go to uh, Walter John Chilson. Do you have some opening remarks? Oh, I thought uh, Donna was going to go first. Well, but we thought we'd go back. Yeah, I'll bring it up a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Common Cause and to uh, Jay Heck as well <clears throat> for uh, bringing about this panel. and and bringing before us these uh, very important issues. Uh, as uh, Jay indicated, I, uh, I served for 24 years <coughs> in the uh, state senate, and many people ask me, uh, Walter John, wouldn't you like to be back in the, in the state senate? We need you there now. I said, N I'd like to be back there, but not the way it is now. The uh, way it was, that would be fine. Uh, well, there used to be some friction. Uh, uh, in my first session, uh, Governor Warren Knowles was a, a liberal Republican, and the uh, assembly was controlled by John Shabazz and uh, Ken Merkel, uh, ultra, ultra conservatives. They, if they had their way, they would have uh, gotten rid of uh, Governor Knowles and uh, replaced him with someone uh, much more conservative. I remember Ken Merkel calling me squishy because I didn't always vote the way he voted. Uh, today, I, I think I would be called a rhino, Republican in name only. But, uh, but who isn't today? <laughs> but uh, it was much different uh, than, oh, uh, you see here uh, what happened to, to good government in Wisconsin. Well, I think my answer is that uh, Tony Earl and I left state government. <laughs> uh, it certainly was different then and, and now. Uh, Tiny Krieger, a Republican, Sheehan Donahue, Republican, Larry Day, conservative Democrat, Tony Earl, liberal Democrat, and I uh, often used to ride back and forth to Madison uh, in the same car. And we were, we were friends. We, we could discuss uh, politics in a very uh, friendly uh, fashion. But today there is total polarity uh, at Madison and uh, in Washington as well. Uh, some observers uh, said that that is the problem uh, on the one hand, they're, uh, for the Democrats, the ultra-liberals are in control, and for Republicans, the ultra-conservatives are in control, and never the twain shall meet. I think uh, what, what is happening now uh, too often is uh, one party and, and the other, they're both at fault, uh, try to blame the other party for inaction rather than trying to come together and uh, solve, get some uh, meaningful solutions. You add to that the uh, awesome and ugly influence that Jay uh, has outlined, the influence of money, huge amounts of money that are now being spent on uh, political campaigns. You said 40 million, I thought it was even 45 million in those recall elections, and that may even be put to, uh, to shame in the uh, uh, Walker rec uh, recall elections and uh, um, more uh, legislative uh, recalls as well. I think that's, uh, that's a travesty as well. All that money being spent uh, is, uh, well, maybe, depending on your position, maybe is not wasted money, but wouldn't it be wonderful if, if 45 to 50 or $75 million could be collected that easily and go to feed uh, poor people in uh, Wisconsin and elsewhere? Uh, money in politics, uh, is involved heavily in at least five of the six subjects that were 
chosen by Jay for comment in uh, tonight's panel. Probably that was his intention because I can see that the the most meaningful thing uh, he sees in uh, what's a problem in uh, our democracy right now is the uh, uh, terrible influence of uh, too much money. Some very brief comments on two of those five. Public financing of the Supreme Court and uh, other state elections, uh, it, it worked for a while, as Jay indicated. It, it might work for the Supreme Court, but the, again, the problem is it's uh, voluntary for the candidates. First, they have to say, we will do it, and you can't keep independent money out of those campaigns as witness the, uh, uh, the most recent uh, Supreme Court election. And regarding uh, uh, redistricting reform for legislatures and uh, congressional seats, when I was in the legislature, we were divided government and uh, uh, we had trouble passing uh, redistricting. And finally we would get something uh, uh, together and uh, uh, get something passed and signed by a governor, but it would then uh, maybe be vetoed by, by the governor or whatever, but uh, it always, I think every uh, redistricting was decided by a federal judge, uh, 1970, 1980, and I think again 90. in 1990. Uh, so it wasn't the legislature, they had an influence, but the, the uh, judges said this is appalling, and they tried to come up with a redistricting that neither Democrats nor Republicans would like, and maybe in that sense we got, uh, got a pretty good uh, redistricting. Um, how do you, uh, right now, how do you get the legislatures who are heavily influenced uh, uh, by the uh, redistricting, how do you get them to uh, agree to uh, take it up? I think we'll need some tremendous pressure uh, on the legislature. I think having an independent uh, uh, group do it, as it does in many states, uh, would be a, a good idea. Um, more common on uh, some of the other uh, listed issues. The impact of the uh, Supreme Court decision, I'll get to that a little bit later, but the merit selection and election of state Supreme Court justices. Uh, I favor a change in the way that the uh, Supreme Courts are picked, but I don't know uh, how to do it correctly. Uh, the Taxpayers Alliance sent out a, a good paper uh, on that uh, recently. There are four different systems right now and it all uh, flows uh, back to uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton and uh, Thomas Jefferson disagreeing. Hamilton thought there ought to be strictly uh, appointments, lifetime appointments for judges, and that would remove the uh, uh, influence uh, and would, would allow them to be uh, nonpartisan. But uh, uh, Jefferson thought that uh, judges should, uh, from time to time at least, uh, uh, face uh, the public. Uh, the first 13 states, though, went along with, with Hamilton. Uh, they had appointments. Uh, then uh, partisan elections uh, became gradually more popular in the early 1980s, and by 1865, by the Civil War time, uh, I think two-thirds of the states uh, did have partisan elections. Then those were looked on as being, uh, having uh, heavily flaws and uh, nonpartisan elections then uh, gained some favor. And then uh, the fourth kind is uh, merit selection, where you uh, try to have a panel recommend to a, an appointing authority, the legislature or the governor, uh, a panel of, uh, of qualified uh, just, uh, justices who could be uh, then uh, appointed for different times. Um, Missouri's uh, system has, uh, that's the system used eventually in Missouri. Uh, it has the best features of appointment and election. 16 states eventually uh, adapted that. Uh, and, uh, but, and it's pointed out in favor of them that none of those 16 states has repealed it as yet. But uh, the uh, opponents say, well, but in the last 25 years, no state has passed that Missouri plan either. So it is, it is looked on as being flawed as well. The problem is that the public, 
the public wants justices accountable to them, and they want them to be fair and impartial at the same time. You know? And if you don't vote the way we think you should, then you're not being fair and impartial. <laughs> uh, I favor a, uh, a study, frankly. Uh, if there's some new ideas that have come up, uh, an impartial study, of course. Uh, I don't know who would appoint that uh, to make it impartial. Uh, Jay Heck, perhaps. Uh, uh, one idea is there would be a, a kind of a training program for justices that they would have to go through first. And then uh, longer elective terms, but we have now tenure terms in Wisconsin, and a Rutgers professor has suggested uh, a single non-renewable term uh, or even a life term, uh, but uh, there could be a, a set retirement age, a life term, but uh, a set retirement age. Um, you know, so literally it wouldn't be for life. Um, uh, disclosures on political spending. I used to think that, uh, that it was all right to have all kinds of money poured into political campaigns and all kinds of money back then was in my case, about $60,000 for every four years. Uh, but uh, th that was all right to have that kind of money as long as it was disclosed that we knew uh, who, uh, where the money was coming from. And it used to be the case that we did know. They had a report to the state, uh, the contributions of uh, over $100, I believe, was the limit anyway. Uh, and then uh, the... Uh, uh, I, I, I forget exactly where I was here. Finally, uh, that Citizen United decision, I think only a future court can overturn or, or change the, uh, or the present court could modify it, uh, or a future court could, could change it. But the best solution, uh, and it's a difficult one, and that is a constitutional amendment to specify that, uh, uh, to limit free speech, that it could not be uh, anyone uh, uh, contributing the unlimited amount of money. You, you would put limits on the amount of money people uh, could uh, uh, contribute, and then also uh, you would have to have disclosure as well. I think that would be uh, the solution. Uh, it would take a long time, perhaps. I forget the uh, process exactly. I believe it's two-thirds of the state so would have to approve a plan put forward by Congress. But uh, lowering the voting age to 18, that took less than four months. Other constitutional amendments have taken many years, but I think that's the, uh, the real solution, and it is a difficult one. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Representative Donna Seidel. Thank you, Rob. Well, good evening. I, too, am very happy to join this panel. Um, appreciate the sponsors, but most importantly, are very happy to have you know, people from the community here, which is the one really very positive thing that has occurred in Wisconsin this year, and that is that we have seen citizens more engaged and more active in the political process than in many, many years, and that is uh, a positive thing. Um, you know, it was just seven years ago when I was uh, a new candidate for the state assembly, and since then I've served three full terms in my fourth term, and certainly was very anxious and very proud to join the legislature in a state whose government had a stellar reputation for being open and, and fair and just, just a great example of um, incredibly good government. And there have been a lot of, unfortunately, uh, there have been a lot of changes and erosions to that and we've seen none more than what has happened in the last 10 months of, of this year. Um, Wisconsin has had an incredibly long and proud history and tradition of progressive politics. And I, I assume that uh, all of you are familiar with the Blue Book, a um, publication every two years of Wisconsin's government. This one is new on the newest session, and the feature article this year is incredibly well done, and what it does is celebrates 
and chronicles the progressive 1911 Wisconsin State Legislature, 1911, and um, really goes into great detail acknowledging the remarkable kinds of reforms that were done when people from all stripes and all ilks got together in Wisconsin and advanced policy that was in the best interest of Wisconsin. As has been said before, Wisconsin was looked at in those years and proved itself as a laboratory for democracy and was a state that was emulated in its policies by many and sometimes all other states. The reforms that were um, advanced in that most successful productive session included election administration. It, was, it had to do with reforms to public education, including establishing the technical college system that, of course, was copied around the, around the country. It um, dealt with critical issues of worker safety, worker conduct, worker health, and as, of course, many of you know, Wisconsin then established the first workers' compensation law right here in Wisconsin, giving birth to Wisconsin Wausau Insurance Company. What Mosiny Paper was the first client to buy a policy. We have so much to be proud of. It also advanced um, environmental protections and regulations, recognizing that our forest and our waters were key and many other just incredibly important things. So we have a lot to be proud of. Ironically and unfortunately, many of those same issues have been addressed just this year. However, the direction of addressing those issues has gone, I'm sad to say, in the opposite direction. When we went back to Madison to begin this legislature, this session in January, none of us could imagine the tumultuous times, the sights and the sounds that we were going to experience there. It began with the um, protests over the collective bargaining changes that were the result of the budget repair bill that was um, surprised, it had a surprise announcement and an intent to be rushed through the legislature very quickly with, uh, with very little public input. It was done by um, a w ignoring the open meetings law that the state legislature had passed and um, imposed on all other units of government in Wisconsin. It was followed by um, a hyper-partisan redistricting plan that has already been man mentioned, and I, and I certainly hope that we spend more time talking about um, a plan that for the first time became a plan that was top down versus bottom up in the past and according to current statu to statute at that time, local governments were to draw plans. Local governments had been spending months with public hearings, spending time and taxpayer money drawing their plans. The uh, majority party overruled that, changed the law, and imposed a statewide plan that had been developed in secret, had taken hundreds of thousands of dollars already in taxpayer money to support um, attorneys that were working with the Republican side, unveiled those plans quickly, and with those redistricting plans, communities of interest were divided as never happened before. Cities like Beloit and Marshfield and Sheboygan divided in half. Um, and 300,000 people had been essentially disenfranchised. This has now been an issue that has gone to the courts and just at the end of last week, a three-judge panel denied a motion to dismiss the um, case again, you know, to redo the redistricting maps and the case will move forward. We then saw the um, uh, voter ID bill pass, as has been talked about already, the most restrictive bill like that passed in this country, uh, a, a bill that many, many of us feel was a solution in search of a problem, will disenfranchise 
tens of thousands of voters across the state. We know from all kinds of studies being done that nationally, 11% of eligible, otherwise eligible voters do not have the photo IDs that would be eligible, and 18% of our seniors do not have these. I have been spending time visiting senior centers in the district, and I have talked to people every week that are incredibly concerned that they are going to have difficulty voting, something that they have been very proud to do all of their lives, many of whom have never missed an election. That too is a subject of a court case. The League of Women Voters has um, filed a case challenging the constitutionality of the current um, voter ID bill in Wisconsin, and we'll watch as that moves through the state. But um, this is the most polarized, divided state um, government that we have certainly seen in our lifetimes in Wisconsin. And while voters across the state have very serious disagreements about so many of our critical issues, one issue remains constant and polls very, very high, and that is that people want this legislature, want Wisconsin's government to work together in the best interest of all of our communities. They are demanding that we do that, and that will take rolling up our sleeves and really deciding that we have to um, compromise, we have to look at a give and take strategy, and that is what the people who have sent us to Madison are demanding. And I certainly would like to get back to the days where Walter John and Tony Earle, you know, duped it out on the floor and went, went in the evening and had a beer together because people do expect that of us and they are demanding that of us. And I hope we can get to that point sooner rather than later. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. Kevin Hermaning. Well, I also want to thank the uh, organization Common Cause and the university uh, and all of the sponsoring organizations for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to take a shorter, I think, uh, introductory period um, and give uh, the other panelists and then the audience the opportunity to uh, address or answer, uh, to ask their specific questions. When I sit up here and I'm hearing about the legislative initiatives and all of the things that have uh, uh, gone right and gone wrong in Madison and in Washington, D.C. I, I think back to the 10 years that I was on the Board of Education in Mosinee, um, originally or initially appointed and then later elected to three uh, separate terms, including a year of absence uh, during which I stepped down from the board because I have been a lifetime advocate of elected official term limits, so I stepped down from the board after two elected terms, then ran it for a completely separate seat on the board and was fortunate enough to get elected. But we dealt with big issues like uh, whether or not uh, bovine growth hormones should be in the lunch milk for the kids and uh, how to fund field trips and uh, Indian logo issues in Mosini uh, and union contracts, other issues that were not very controversial, of course, as you can imagine. Um, but the reality is that uh, at a school district level, and not necessarily different in the Madison legislature, although legislators in Madison are first and foremost legislators, elected officials at the local levels and our school boards are more involved in governance, not in legislative initiatives, not in changing and passing laws, though we do pass and, and make policies and procedures that are impacted, uh, that do impact the, the citizens of a community and in my case of a school district. But I think that if we did have a more governance-oriented intent among many of our legislators, uh, rather than believing that it is their job to simply um, add more layers of legislative uh, action on top of what's ha already in place, uh, that we might have less polarizing uh, uh, debate in Madison, and, and certainly, or for that matter, in Washington, D.C. Certainly if we look abroad at some of the real fighting that goes on in other legislative organizations, I don't think anybody wants to see uh, um, 
although I do understand that in the 80s and 90s there were legislators in Madison who did come to fisticuffs, um, it wasn't nearly to the effect that happens overseas, including uh, where there are people actually shot in legislative halls globally, so um, uh, based on uh, uh, opponents' positions on issues. So I looked at uh, the issues that Jay talked about uh, in, in, in what Common Cause advocates for, advocates for, and I, I just wanted to point out that um, to me, most of the organizations, initiatives, most of the moves toward campaign finance reform, toward disclosure, toward redistricting reform, really to me um, come to the issue of the First Amendment and the freedom of speech issues. Freedom of speech is guaranteed, but equality of speech is not. And so that is where we really come down to brass tacks in trying to deal with the challenges and the concerns that, that I think people have and how they can, quote, improve state or national government. You know, we looked at what's going on in Washington, D.C. and in Madison this year and in the year, last year and a half. We look at the rise of the Tea Parties uh, over the last two and a half years. We look at what's gone on uh, over the last, I guess, about 50 days now or 40 some days in many, many cities around the country, the Occupy Wall Street and their sub-organizations around, around the U.S. And I think it's really a matter of the proverbial um, pot boiling, uh, or rather I should say simmering, the frog over a long period of time. I think many citizens in our country feel like they are that proverbial frog. And they've watched the government infringe and take and regulate and put in place rules which, which, with which they disagree. And so it shouldn't be a surprise and it, to anybody, and it certainly isn't to me, that people on both sides of the political fence, last year the Tea Party, this year the recall election advocates and the Occupy Wall Street folks, feel that the only way that they can affect change is by taking what at least those of us up on the panel believe are extreme measures. It used to be that every two years we elected our state legislators and every four years, our governor and our U state senators. Now we are in a perpetual election phase and stage. And lest anybody imagine that if the Democrats were to win the state Senate or they were to achieve their goal of defeating Governor Walker in the recall elections, next year, that that pendulum sp swings back and forth faster than ever these days. And the next time it swings back, it's going to take out people who maybe were more willing to consider alternatives to some of the more extreme positions being taken. But when the citizens of Wisconsin in 2010 stepped back and they saw what they as a collective group maybe not anybody in this room or maybe not a lot of you in this room, but felt the overreaching arm of state government and the overspending of state government. They felt it was time for a change. And apparently, this past year, the side that lost felt that it wasn't right to wait for a full year. Now, all the reasons why they decided to go on and pursue the recall elections we look at the financing of those and we look at, as Jay talked about, more of the secret nature of where the money is coming from. I don't particularly like the idea that my federal and state tax dollars, and not just from the checkoff, but that my federal and state tax dollars should have to go to perpetuating incumbency of either party, Republicans or Democrats. Serving in public office was never intended to be a lifetime career. Now, I do think we have to encourage young people to understand that certainly everyone up at this table believes 
that elective service and, and working for elected leaders, as well as being involved in citizen, particip through par citizen participation in elective politics, is a noble and honorable calling. I very strongly believe that. But it was never intended to be a lifetime career. And I think that's what really hacks a lot of people off in our society today. And when people are trying to protect their rear ends and they're trying to perpetuate a lifetime of elective service at what I would view largely is the public trough, it is not surprising that we see the types of expensive campaigns and outside influences that perpetuate largely the incumbents, not challenger candidates. So I'll wait for any additional comments that might come after questions. Thank you. And we'll go to Eric Giordano. Thank you, Rob, and um, thank you to Jay and Sandra from Common Cause for uh, initiating this event and fellow panelists. It's been a real pleasure to hear some of the things you've had to say so far, and to you, the audience. I appreciate the, cha the chance to have uh, have a few moments here with you. So I want to take the first question or the main question of the night. Should we be worried about good government in Wisconsin? And the answer is undoubtedly yes. But it's not just because we've had a tumultuous election year it's, uh, uh, and, uh, and governance year. It's also because uh, our founding fathers asked the very same question. Should we be worried about good government generally in our country? And the answer was a resounding yes. And the Federalist Papers, for those of you who remember your history lessons, uh, were all about how to achieve uh, the best form of government in the face of very challenging human nature problems. Mm -hmm. If men were angels, right, uh, we would have no need of government. But they aren't, and therefore we always have to be worried about government. Are there some reasons to be particularly worried about Wisconsin government and our national government today? My <coughs> argument would be yes. There are some reasons even beyond the normal reasons our founding fathers discussed. So I'd like to address a couple of the main topics that were already discussed and talk about why these topics concern me, uh, both as a political scientist but also as a citizen. So Chris, if you could just put up the, I, I only brought a couple slides, but I wanted to start with the uh, uh, redistricting issue, right? Let's take an easy one. And so I have a couple slides that I'd like to put up. Just two. So this famous uh, drawing you might remember from your history and your American government class. This was the, fa the first redistricting that helped to create the term called gerrymandering was actually created. Uh, this district that's shaped sort of like a dragon or salamander was actually created by the governor of Wisconsin at the time whose name was Elbridge Gary. And, um, from Massachusetts, what did I say? Wisconsin. I meant, oh, did I say Wisconsin? I'm so sorry. Massachusetts, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we can obviously see the, the, the intent of the cartoonist here to portray this as a, as a problem uh, in terms of drawing a map that didn't reflect either reality or the interests of the voters. So Chris, if you can switch to the next slide. So let's take a look at Wisconsin and what is being proposed in the redistricting of Wisconsin. And in particular, you'll note the 7th, 3rd, 6th districts uh, for in the current map, and then you'll see the proposed map as the GOP would have, would have it be drawn. And I don't know what you would call that shape. Some people have called it the thumb. It seems to protrude out. Some have called it the camel and the hump. Um, but the thing that's a little disturbing to me about the redistricting being proposed by the GOP is that it divides communities that have been voting uh, for years as a community. So for example, Chippewa Falls is completely cut off uh, from the immediate north. We also see Marshfield being divided. We see Wisconsin Rapids being taken out, uh, the whole River Valley and the shape of that being changed in terms of voting patterns. Now, here's the thing. This may be an inappropriate prediction, but I'm really not sure 
that this is going to um, receive any difficulty in terms of passing court muster. If we look at redistricting efforts in Texas and Georgia and North Carolina and other places over the years, we see some pretty crazily uh, drawn districts uh, and they, that, that they have been upheld uh, by the courts. So it's sort of the way that we've uh, interpreted the um, results of redistricting in our country in a winner-take-all system that um, depending on the, the, the nature of who decides the redistricting, uh, unless there is some disenfranchisement of certain select groups under the 1965 Voting Act, uh, certain minority groups, then most of these types of redistrictings tend to hold up in court. Now, having said that, does that mean that uh, it would be good to, or not good to have redistricting reform? Uh, reform? Uh, my answer would be, um, we have to look at the unintended consequences of this type of behavior. Would the Democrats have redistricted uh, the way the Republicans are proposing had they controlled the state house this year? Uh, probably not, but then the argument would be, well, that's because the current districts favor the incumbents. And so the purpose of redistricting from a political standpoint always has been to find a way to either favor the incumbents, well, frankly, to favor the incumbents. That's, that's who draws the districts. And so this is an attempt to, to do that. Now, um, the problem is, even as I, as I look at this as a voter and say, I don't really like the shape of this, I don't like the nature and the purpose behind you know, this redistricting, what are the alternatives? And, and that's where we have to really look because other states and, and other countries do some different things. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, they have more proportional systems. And so what they do is they essentially uh, put their districts together and have proportional voting. And that allows people's votes to have more meaning, but it also introduces uh, unintended consequences that we would have to think about, such as the rise of third parties in our country, and are we prepared you know, to have a system where third parties might actually have a say? Uh, so this is one thing that's definitely unique about our system in a winner-take-all. Uh, it's going to favor one or the other of two major parties. Um, there's also other states that have tried to come up with different formulas, um, and there's different algorithms. For example, you take the size of the state, you divide it up into you know n number of of segments with each segment having a certain population and that's how we're going to get to our you know our districting the problem there of course is that that sometimes divides cities right down the middle as well so there isn't one formula that's necessarily going to be in place that's going to please everybody there's always going to be somebody that's going to say well why am i voting in this district and my neighbors in the other or why is this shaped a little strange here or there? Um, so that's one issue that we'd have to grapple with if we're serious about taking on the challenge of redistricting. What would be our formula for doing that? I can look at this map and I can say as a citizen, this concerns me because it's a pretty blatant attempt to change the political dynamics uh, in the districts of Wisconsin. Uh, but then you know, we need to be serious and, and uh, be willing to address alternatives. All right, let's move on to something else, Chris. You can take that slide off, thank you. Let's talk about um, judicial elections and the influence of money. Now, I come from one of the 13 colonies. I came uh, originally from Virginia. So for me, it was kind of new to, to be here in Wisconsin and see the election of judges. And I, and I have to tell you, I had a very strong bias against it right from the start because of the very reasons that we've been talking about and Jay mentioned tonight, the influence of money. And this is before the recent elections and when everything you know, went crazy and before Citizens United and before you know, the undisclosed money that's being poured into these elections. I tend to be the type of person who believes that an appointment, although it's still politically motivated often uh, for life, allows the justice some degree and measure of independence, even if those justices were appointed by Democrats or Republicans. And, you know, we can just take the Supreme Court as an example. I mean, look at uh, Justice Souter, uh, appointed by George Bush. Um, look at Justice Kennedy. Uh, look at others, uh, Sandra O'Connor, who, 
who really ended up being, you know, sort of a middle of the road uh, swing vote for so long. So one never knows uh, how justices are going to end up, even if we think we know their bona fides uh, beforehand. So I would argue personally that I would like to see a different system. I like the fact that Walter brought up a few different options, and I think those should be explored. I very much worry about the system of justice in Wisconsin in which justices are beholden, not just to the people, but in this case, uh, because of Citizens United, special interests, and special interests whom we do not know. This concerns me quite a bit. Let's talk about Citizens United really quickly. The one thing that I'm very disappointed about on a personal level is that when Justice Roberts was testifying before the Senate committee, judicial committee, on his belief and in the, in the uh, principle of stare decisis, which is basically that we believe uh, in the concept of having decisions that were made previously by the court as having some weight. So we don't overturn decisions um, willy-nilly. If we did that, we'd essentially have no continuity in the court. And he said, yes, I do principally believe in that, in that concept, that we should let decisions that have gone before uh, have some significant weight. It seems that he forgot this when he ruled in the Citizens United case. And this, for me, was a disappointment. I think the Citizens United case, as has been pointed out, truly dismantled in my mind, 30 years of very significant legislation. You could go back to Teddy Roosevelt and say 100 years, as Jay did, but clearly at least 30 years of very strong movement away from trying to uh, have money, have the strong influence in politics that it had for so many years. Now, I know that the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, uh, also known as the McCain-Feingold Act, had problems, and it had major loopholes, and I don't think any thinking person thought otherwise. But to overturn this to the, the, the degree they did, when in the case itself, Justice Stevens argued, which I think was correct, that they could have overturned this ruling on very narrow grounds. Instead, the court decided to overturn it on very large sweeping grounds that undermined this principle of previous decisions and their importance and their weight in the court. Uh, so I'm very disappointed in this because I think it has some serious unintended consequences, or maybe they're intended, which would be worse. But to be able to have a loophole so large that you can have unlimited amounts of money that go into third-party groups and that th that money can be spent on campaign advertising uh, without really any restriction on, on what it's saying, uh, really puts the voter in a difficult position. A voter who is trying to be educated about issues, trying to do the best they can to be informed, to be bombarded day after day with commercials and advertisements that we know are, not, are, are only partially factual. We know this because there are groups now that keep track of these things. And we know that many of these advertisements are false or misleading, partially true, and this is disturbing for average citizens. It should be disturbing, I think, uh, for democracy. And yet, and yet, I say this knowing that the rulings and the, and the uh, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act had some major flaws that had to be addressed. And, and let's remember what the series of events was. I'm not going to go into too much detail. The first one was the airing of... Um, uh, Michael Moore's uh, Fahrenheit 911, which was challenged in court as being aired uh, near or too close to an election, and it was sort of going against George Bush, and therefore some thought that it was inappropriate and a violation of the law. The court struck that down, said no, that really isn't. We don't think that's the intention. It was created by a third party. It wasn't created by you know a PAC or or a campaign or a party. Um, so then another enterprising group decided to make a movie called Hillary the Movie. You might remember this. And they were airing that within 30 days of a primary. And that also uh, came under scrutiny and, and under some uh, uh, leg uh, sorry, legal action. Here the, the court uh, decided to not allow that movie to be shown by saying that pretty much this movie was intended to 
defame uh, this candidate within 30 days of a primary election. So part of the issue was that was argued in the court in the Citizens United case was how then do we draw the line between those types of movies and events and, and commercials that defame candidates close to an election time and one word or phrase that could be uttered in a book that was sold on Amazon.com that said something negative about Hillary Clinton 30 days before the primary, 60 days before the election. I mean, in, in theory, it could open up the floodgates for banning all sorts of material. So in this sense, I do respect what Kevin is saying about free speech, but I do think that there, there have to be some limits on, on money and, and the idea that, that corporations and unions and other groups can spend now any amount of money uh, on issue advertising in which they can mention candidates and basically spin all sorts of untruths is very disturbing. Um, let's look at, um, let's do questions. Let's do questions. Rob yeah. says let's do questions. That's I have it. one more point, one last point, Rob. Here's my biggest concern tonight. It's not even any of those things. It's the fact that we seem to have lost a sense of civility in politics and a sense of safe space for talking about difficult political issues. I appreciate what I've heard tonight because I'm, what I'm hearing is that this actually is a safe space, which I appreciate very much. But what I would like to see are some safe spaces for our current elected leaders to be able to talk through issues without the media scrutiny, without the special interests that bear down on them at all times and all places so that they can have these sort of relationships and discussions that need to be had in a democracy, in a well-functioning democracy. I think there's some responsibility on us, though, as well, as voters and citizens. And the responsibility is that we are the ones who are subject to these advertisements. We are the ones who listen or don't listen. We are the ones who choose to watch MSNBC or Fox News. When are we going to wake up and start taking responsibility for the decisions that we are making as citizens? I think that has to be said, and I appreciate the time to be able to say it. All right, we'll go to the audience. Um, I would ask that your questions be questions, and, uh, and that you keep it short, and we'll, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, who's got a, got a question, concern, who'd like to start? My name's my name is Bob Beck, and I've been frustrated with the veracity of the TV commercials. So I'm not going to be raising the issue of the, uh, where the commercials have come from or how many there are. But I'm proposing you and the rest of the audience to think about such a thing as we have a rating system on TV that evaluates programming on generally accepted morality. I would like you to discuss and hopefully implement a similar system that holds TV stations responsible and accountable for the veracity of the political commercials they air, including appropriate penalties for noncompliance. I suggest G would be great for truthfulness and helpfulness. PG would be pretty good for not bending the truth or obscuring reality significantly or mind-changing omissions. M for macabre, for appealing to feelings of horror without regard to truth or appropriateness. R, for repulsive, irrelevant, personal, with intent to sicken us against someone or something, again without regard to a candidate's ability to do the job. And X, exactly false and without merit. Now, I understand that there have to be uh, two caveats here. The first one is I talked to somebody. At least two, I would think. <laughs> Well, two that I can think of. Uh, regardless of how moral and reasonable the above might be, the following legal restrictions might apply which need to be addressed and or changed. First is the TV stations might have to accept all political advertising without any form of censorship. Uh, political ads might be able to have priority over regular ads. And these restrictions might be federal law. I recognize that. But then I just heard about the possibility that if these restrictions cannot be removed or modified, 
then it's possible to peaceably walk on sidewalks in front of driveways into and from the offending TV stations, thus causing interesting confrontations. Thank you. Actually, who would like to, to respond? A rating system for political ads. Can I borrow that for my kids? <laughs> Let me just take a, a quick crack at that to say, um, you know, political speech can sometimes be uh, unbelievable and even, as you, as you mentioned, without a lot of truth, but so can commercial advertisements. So, uh, you know, my view, and constitutionally, and, you know, I, I think all of you would agree, there's really nothing you can do to regulate the content of these, of these communications. But what you can do, it seems to me, and what you should do is that in the period before an election, and this is all we're talking about, I'm not talking about telling groups that they have to tell us who they are 365 days a year. I'm not saying that, you know, the Mosini uh, firefighters or the Wausau, you know, dancers or whoever, whatever group you want to say needs to identify all of their members if they're going to communicate with the public. I, 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 don't, I think that is overbroad, and I, I don't think that's what we want. What we're simply trying to do constitutionally, and the, cons and, the, and the courts have said, you cannot be overbroad and you have to be specific. And that's why the period of 60 days before an election was chosen in the McCain-Feingold law. And by the way, there's nothing in Citizens United that, that eliminated that. What you can do is you can say in 60 days before an election, when generally people are tuned in to election issues, that any organization that runs an ad or a widely disseminated communication. This is not an email between Kevin and Donna. It, this is a widely disseminated communication that the public is subject to. If there's no other reasonable interpretation other than that's intended to influence the outcome of election, that's when disclosure gets tuned in. That is, that is a definition that has been accepted broadly across this country by Republicans and by Democrats. It's specific, it's not overbroad, it doesn't, doesn't require all speech be disclosed, but it does require that at least you have the right to know who before an election is trying to influence your vote. Not tell you how to vote, but try to influence your vote. I'm afraid that although Great Britain and European countries are able to do many of the things that you've said, we have things like Politic Fact. we do have some newspapers that now look at these ads and try to you know, judge the veracity of them. But, you know, under this system of government, which everybody agrees is imperfect, but the best that's ever been invented, that's about the best we can do. But we should do it. Right. Any other responses to this one, or should we? All right, who else? Ned. And I'm speaking constitutionally. What Thank we you. Do. I'd like to commend the League of Women Voters for their stand on voters' ID law, taking it to court. I think it is something that needs to go to court and go through the legal system. And um, I think the current law has one intention, and that is voter suppression. When you look at the research and see how many illegal votes were actually cast in the last couple decades of elections, there's a handful, maybe, uh, maybe 10, maybe even 100 at the very most, very, very most is something less than 100. Now, when you look at the number of disenfranchised voters, we're talking tens, hundreds of thousands of voters. It's so disproportionate, it's just ridiculous to consider disenfranchising that many voters. So I applaud the League of Women Voters for taking this to court it should go to court and it should be overruled to have the most restrictive type of voter suppression in the country in our state is deplorable. We used to be, as it says on the screen, whatever happened to good government in Wisconsin. This is part of good government, is the ability for each person to vote in a representative republic, which is what we have. So um, the data that we heard tonight I'm going to assume is correct. 11% uh, don't have a voter ID and 18% of seniors will be affected. This is a very large proportion of potential Wisconsin voters. So 
I would like to see people take a stand on this and let their representatives know that this is simply unacceptable, what went through the legislator on that one topic. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now, panelists did speak on voter ID. Would anyone like to defend the voter ID law? Kevin? I would say that I don't believe at all that anybody advocating for the legislative bill or the governor who signed the bill had intent or desire voter suppression. I think it would... Hang on now. Let's, 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 hear, believe, let's be respectful. I believe that it was voter confidence that they are trying to put forth. When we look at the number of overseas military voters ballots which were disenfranchised, when you look at the number of duplicate students on college campuses, uh, of students who voted both in their hometowns as well as in the campuses, at the campus uh, areas where they were going to school, and sometimes political activists on both sides who sought to vote more than one time, it's just a matter of each honest voter wanting to make sure that no other voter had the opportunity to cast more than one vote. It's about voter confidence, not voter suppression. I think I, the, the question was raised about how, what problem was this bill intending to solve and was voter fraud a legitimate problem in the state of Wisconsin? I think that we saw a very thorough, exhaustive investigation after the 2008 election. And after that election, 19 cases were prosecuted. 19 cases out of millions of votes cast were prosecuted. Of those 19, 10 were cases that were felons voting. And this is a situation where um, felons who have been released from prison but were still under state supervision and had the ability to get and have a driver's license voted and, have their, and, and had their driver's license for voting purposes. I can tell you from a court official over a number of years, great misunderstanding about when a person after serving time from prison is eligible to vote. The other um, primary number of um, cases of the 19, six were uh, um, illegal or problems with improper registration. So spending $7 million in state money, disenfranchising tens of thousands of voters, most of whom are seniors, are students, and minorities is once again um, a, a far overreach and a reaction to a problem that does not exist in Wisconsin. And once again, the most restrictive um, law in, in this country against the tradition that w Wisconsin has always had in terms of leading the nation and having just a stellar voting, voting turnout and really regarding the right to vote as a key right and encouraging and making it as easy as possible for people to exercise their vote. And that will not be the case with this law in place. Donna, what's easier than free? I said, what's easier than free? Well, I can tell you from a number of people I talked to, although the people without um, a photo ID are in instructed to go to the DMV and get a, um, an, uh, an identification card through there, are finding out, one, that the law was put in place that although these were at no cost, the personnel at DMV were not to say that they were in, at no cost and only make them um, without charge if the person asking for it knew in advance that that was the opportunity. And many of them have been charged $28. Secondary to that, people, many people need a copy of a birth certificate to get a photo ID, and the charge for a birth certificate is more than $20. Many times that is a hardship for people, and that has been challenged as being a cost to vote. By making that necessary. Let, let, let me jump in here for just a second. Um, it, it would be one thing if currently in Wisconsin there were there was no form of ID required when you went to the polls. Now, what, but what I, but it's really hard, I think, to defend is we've gone from that 
to the most restrict restrictive forms. In other states, you can use any form of federal ID, any form of local ID. You can use any form of school ID. You can use any a gun permit. In Alabama, you can use your hunting permit or your concealed and carry permit. That's a form of ID. None of those are accepted in Wisconsin, none of them. The only things that are accepted are a student ID, although all the existing student IDs on campus are not any good. They all have to be revised, they'll have to be changed. A passport, military uh, ID is, is fine. But why just DOT issued? And why driver's licenses, yeah, but why just DOT? Why are these other forms not permitted? That's, that's the very restrictive and I think indefensible part of this. All of it's indefensible. You don't have a constitutional right to uh, rent a video. You don't have a constitutional right you know, to, show, to have to show your ID for a lot of things. It is your constitutional right to be able to vote. And, and I think this is, this is a terrible imposition uh, on a lot of voters. So it's the restrictiveness, the restrictive nature of the forms of ID that are required that I find particularly offensive. Well, let's move on. Let's see if we can get a couple more questions in. And we'll see one on that side of the room. Seems fair, let's, who wants to start? I'll start. Um, I think from what I have looked at, um, there is some reason to be concerned perhaps about a paperless ballot. Many people are starting to say, let's do some kind of a system where you can machine count ballots, but have the potential in case there is some question or some need for a recount to be able to have some paper record. So I would personally support a system where it can be computerized, where it can be counted, but there is some sort of paper trail that can be hand delivered, hand counted. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's a reasonable expectation that there could be a paper trail when automation is questioned and serious concerns are raised. We saw them in the last uh, judicial election where suddenly, um, well after elections, uh, votes were counted and posted, 17,000 votes surprisingly turned up and the explanations were very, very questionable. So I think that not only in Wisconsin, but because of a number of very, um, problematic situations around the country and what is at stake, to have a system whereby a paper trail is available to um, restore confidence is something that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, my understanding, and those of you that work on the ground in elections would know better, but my understanding is that in Wisconsin now, pretty much every polling place in the state uses what's called an optical scanner. So you do have a paper trail. It's a, it's a paper ballot that you feed through, they count it electronically, and then there is the paper ballot. And my understanding further is that 
when they were looking through in the Kloppenberg Prosser recount, there was discrepancy sometimes between the electronic count and the actual paper count, the, the actual voter count, and, that, and that's where some of that came in. So I do think that we've come a long way. I know since 2000, we have a pretty uniform system throughout the state that does utilize the optical scanner. There used to be some voting precincts that used only levers, and there used to be a few that had what were called the Diebold, the electronic machines. Not very many, but a few. So I think we have, and I'll give credit to the Government Accountability Board and the, uh, and the, and the Federal uh, Voting Act that requires some uniformity. So I think that's important. The problem in the uh, Supreme Court election was that one of the county clerks, Waukesha County, uh, she, did, she, she wanted to keep the results in her office for a while. And as, as it turns out, I don't, think she, I don't think she manipulated the votes, but it was the type of thing that raised grave concern in such a close election about why weren't those reported and what was the problem. She's been reprimanded. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the GAB and others have, have basically said that if you ever do this again, you're out. Uh, I hope that's the case because that's the kind of stuff that undermines uh, confidence in our elections. Having said that, yeah, can we improve it? We should always look for ways to improve it. Yeah, I want to say in addition to what Jay has said, there was a thorough investigation of that and there was no uh, hanky-panky involved. It was uh, a stupid error on, on the part of that, uh, that clerk to uh, misplace those ballots uh, for a, a time, but uh, they found, thoroughly uh, found, investigated and found that there was no uh, intent to try to uh, manipulate uh, the outcome. Uh, and I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, what you said about paper ballots uh, because where I vote in the town of Weston, we, I vote on a paper ballot and it's put into a machine and that ballot is, paper ballot is available for a recount later on. So I'm, I'm sure we have what you're suggesting now unless I misunderstand your suggestion. I see. So it's in the Kevin. It's in the recounting that you. Yeah, I see. Okay. I'm uh, I'm not a member, dues-paying or otherwise, of the Constitution Party of the United States, but one of the platform issues of the Constitution Party of the United States is that all elections would be done with paper ballots, hand counted. I happen to advocate for that, but I would go a step further and I would say that if it's good enough to put your finger into a uh, piece of per into a jar of purple ink on election day, now you want to talk about voting once. If it's good enough in Iraq, we ought to be able to do something like that here to prove that you only voted one time. Um, I have a question. I'll take a moderator's prerogative. The, I have a question for Jay Heck. Um, there are right now, I think it's, you may have said, I think it's 14 states that have some form of public financing of elections. Um, it just, it seems to me, forgive me, it seems like there are more examples of more or less broken public financing than there are those that, that really work well. Can you point to models? Like where, where is an example of, of a public financing system that really works that Wisconsin should use as a model? Well, uh, you know, it's been said that Minnesota and Wisconsin are two states that are very much alike. They have more Swedes, we have more Norwegians. They have 10,000 lakes, we have 12,000. We have two Great Lakes, they only have one. We're alike in many ways, but the way they do their public financing. Maine and Arizona are the one the states most people talk about. It's 100% public financing. In Minnesota, it's 50% public financing. But every candidate, Republican and Democrat, agrees to spending limits in Minnesota. Elections for the state legislature in Minnesota are not won by money. They are won by ideas because everybody spends the same amount. The gubernatorial election in 2010 between Tom Emmer and Mark Dayton costs less than $10 million total. Wisconsin, $37 million. They have limits in Wisconsin. They have public financing. Republicans take it. Democrats take it because the culture, in and I'm sorry, in Minnesota, because the culture in Minnesota is that if you spend more than the spending limit, you're trying to buy the election, and that works against you. And it's ingrained there. And I think we can get there. And Republicans and Democrats like the system too because on the state income tax checkoff, 
you check off what party you want your five bucks to go to. So if you're a conservative Republican, your money's not going to go to a liberal. If you're a Democrat, your money's not going to go to a Republican. You can direct where your five bucks goes. And here's the other great part about Minnesota. They also have a system that encourages small donors that if you contribute $50 to any candidate for the legislature or statewide or even to the state parties, you get a $50 refund from the state of Minnesota. The Republicans like it because they think that's giving back money to the people. It's tax reform. And what it does is it encourages small donations. So there's a model right next door that we could just travel, you know, 100 miles or whatever it is to, to Minnesota uh, and adopt a lot of it in this state. And I think I For think just we that have one thing, confidence. just the one thing from Minnesota. No, I'm sorry? Just the, yeah. Um, any, anyone else? Yeah. I don't know. That's the only thing. Yeah. yeah, not the Vikings, not anything else. <laughs> just, just their public finance. Rob, I would say that um, the average taxpayer in the United States finds it abhorrent that they financed Lyndon LaRouche's six cult campaigns for president of the United States, or the uh, National Law Party's uh, levitation candidate, uh, Hagelin, I believe is his name. Lind uh, Thomas Jefferson, way back when, said, to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions with which he disagrees and disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. I believe that. I believe that no citizen should be compelled, and you're not suggesting, Jay, that they should be, but public it has financing. To be it has to be voluntary. Yeah, public financing. The average citizen, the average taxpayer, when they file their tax return, has failed in large sums of, in, in large numbers, to check off the voluntary box, despite the fact that it wasn't going to come it wasn't going to increase their tax. Um, the average citizen apparently doesn't agree. A lot of them don't know what it is. Yeah. There's probably some of that too. So, all right, so moving on, who else has a question? Let's go. We're, uh, we're running a little long. We want to be respectful of your time, but maybe we can get a couple more in. Yes. I have a question for all of you too. Um, I saw an old movie just the other day and a man from Africa pointed to the flags outside the UN and said, we should take down all the flags of the country and what we should do is put up the flags of the corporations. That government, state or uh, the country are run by corporations and what I would like to hear from you because I'm, my hope is getting smaller and smaller I want to know what is the hope that we have that the people can, can be in charge, what we've been talking about of elections and that, and not corporations. Because it seems to me, no matter what we say, it is money that is talking. And I guess from you, because I hear you all trying to work together, which is nice to see, um, to give us what you see is at the hope, the hope for the future, not for just us, but for our children and grandchildren, that this all won't continue to be run by money. Thank you. Who, who has hopeful thoughts for the future? No hope for the future? Well, I, th I think what we've seen in Wisconsin and what we've seen nationally is um, an indication of how the future can be changed. And that is the, the individual citizens want to take back their government. It's what we saw this spring in Wisconsin when hundreds of thousands of people went to the Capitol to protest, to say, we demand that our voices be heard. We know that there was an attempt to rush through legislation that deeply impacted many uh, middle class families around the state without public input. and people saying we're not going to stand for it. The recalls, many people are opposed to that, but nevertheless is a result of people being angry, being frustrated, and feeling like they're not being listened to. On the national level, we're seeing the, um, the take back, the, uh, the Wall Street protests. I think we have never seen a more involved, engaged public, and because of that, um, we can see a difference in this, in this state and in this country. Mm. 
That is hopeful. I think uh, I've already stated that I strongly support uh, uh, getting the influence of money out of uh, campaigns. I think it's difficult to do it because of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision. The only way we're going to change that is to get the Supreme Court to change it or to pass a constitutional amendment. I don't see any other, other way except uh, perhaps we can get what works in Minnesota to act in Wisconsin with public uh, funding of uh, campaigns. That, uh, that would take the money out as well, and I, I favor anything that would take the money, uh, unidentified money especially, but there's billion, millions and, and in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars at the federal level uh, that is coming from corporations. But Donna, I, uh, I think that uh, Wall Street is uh, being manipulated and guided by uh, the Democrat Party and by the unions. However, I think it is unwise. I don't agree with Rush Limbaugh. I don't agree with Rush Limbaugh that uh, they are a bunch of know-nothings. I think we have a real concern that may perhaps be that, that the, uh, uh, this is evidence of uh, like being a uh, canary in the coal mine. It is warning us of some serious uh, problem and uh, uh, should be, uh, be listened to. Uh, but I, I think the same thing about manipulating crowds. Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that half of the people uh, who were down in Madison complaining about the uh, Walker initiatives on collective bargaining were from outside the state of Wisconsin. They were that would not, that would not, demo that would not democracy in action. That was mobocracy. You know, um, your question was about business and its influence on elections and politics. And Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was in up to 2002 when uh, corporations and labor unions could contribute soft money to campaigns. Federal elections. Federal elections, yeah. exactly. And the studies showed at that time that both unions and business contributed largely approximately equal amounts to those campaigns and those candidates. Um, it would seem to me that, for example, when you look at Citizens United, it appears to me that media organizations, electronic and print, should actually welcome the Citizens United um, decision because it guarantees that corporations, media corporations, can influence and be involved in political uh, speech. Now, unless this gentleman's recommendation in the front is gonna give me the power, and I think it should, to decide whether or not Rob Menser's editorials that he writes before elections or between them is either PG or R and repulsive, um, I, whose decision is it going to be that is going, who on the committees, who appointed by the legislature, which judges? Is the Supreme Court a fair arbiter? I think most of you right now think no. And yet, who is going to appoint these citizens, these nonpartisan, unaffiliated individuals to these do-good organizations, these redistricting boards? In 1970, 1980, 1990, and 1991, yes, the judges got involved because the legislature couldn't come to terms. But Donna, would you rather have the legislature redistrict or would you like me to be appointed by Governor Walker to a commission? What's the difference? Well, I think a nonpartisan, a nonpartisan legislative body commission could be doing that. But I want to respond to your, you know, the, the point you made about the years when corporations oh, and unions um, had the same expenditures. Your, things have changed in, over the years, and clearly the corporations have got exponentially wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And states like Wisconsin have made a point to dismantle the ability of unions to support <laughs> political activities. So uh, the playing field, if it had been level one, certainly isn't anymore. And I think there's grave concern about that. It's Kevin. just the compulsory collection of dues not the payment toward campaigns, not the donations of individual teachers or state employees to contribute to the candidate of their choice. It's the forced manipulation of the electoral process that apparently the governor and the supportive legislature believed in this year. To get back to your question, I think one of the problems that I see is this deep 
philosophical divide between money as free speech and money as a potentially corrupting influence on, on political behavior. And I'm not sure that we're going to reconcile that. And, and here's the ultimate irony. The special interests that are the ones pouring the money into the election, apparently they're not convincing the voters as much as I would like them to be convinced otherwise because they keep voting for the same system and the same candidates that, that uh, are affini have affinity to that <coughs> system. So I, I hate to be pessimistic, but um, I think we need change. And I, I would really heartily disagree with Kevin on the issue of the ability of nonpartisan groups to have not necessarily a perfect record when it comes to uh, trying to be impartial in redistricting, but certainly have a better shot at it than elected officials beholden to special interests. Uh, we see many, many instances of this, retired judges, uh, people with respect in the community. I mean, look at the workers' compensation. We just had a program on that here in the community. This is a wonderful system that's operated by both Democrats and Republicans, uh, and they do a fantastic job that both you know, business and labor can agree to. We can have these boards if we want them. Uh, and let, let me just uh, point to an example of where, where this works. Uh, Senator Michael Ellis, who I've referred to a number of times, uh, after the caucus scandal in 1980, I'm sorry, 2002, 2003, uh, got together with uh, my organization and some others, Senator John Erpenbach, some other people, and put together this government accountability board to replace the discredited and, uh, and the dysfunctional state elections board, which was highly partisan and the uh, State Ethic Ethics Board, which was toothless, and created an independent body which has an independent source of funding to conduct investigations into corruption in state government. This is, this, the GAB's worked very well. It's got six retired judges at the top who were chosen on the basis of their nonpartisan credentials. They're not affiliated with any political party. They're judges, they're retired judges. It's about the closest you can come to to getting that sort of nonpartisan entity. That's the best you can do. And it's worked pretty well. We could do that for redistricting in Wisconsin. We could get a panel of individuals like that. I think it's possible to do that, as a, to have a panel like that, to do the recommending to the governor for candidates for uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that we can do on a nonpartisan basis. But I also think that corporate influence or union influence or whatever influence by any special interest group is best combated by three things. Number one, transparency and disclosure. If we know who behi who's behind the money, then we have some ability to be able to make a decision about whether we want to support a candidate or not based on the money that's behind them. This worked very well in Minnesota, which has a strong disclosure bill, when the Target Corporation was caught backing of one particular candidate at odds with the public stance they'd taken on several other issues, and a lot of people raised a lot of hell in Minnesota, and uh, that corporation uh, found that, you know, they had to be more responsive to the people of Minnesota. The other thing I do think, uh, public financing, at least, at the very least, Kevin, it takes the, the sense of being beholden to one or two special interests or or another special interest, you're beholden to the public if you, if, you, if you have public financing. And by the way, the public financing doesn't necessarily have to come from the, from the Treasury. It can come from a lot of sources. In Arizona, they, they have a 10% surcharge on criminal and uh, civil forfeitures. The motto in Arizona, criminals pay for elections. <laughs> and it works. Other states in North Carolina to They're pay for their- alone. They're doing it That's well. right. In North Carolina, to pay for their public financing system. I thought they were electing crooks. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. The crooks pay for the elections. But in North Carolina, the lawyers all kick in $50 for judicial elections. And lawyers love it because they know when they go before the Supreme Court of North Carolina or even the appellate court that they know that the, the opposing lawyer hasn't given more in campaign contributions <laughs> than they have. There's no money accepted by the judges. So there are creative ways to do this. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't stop doing it. And I, I happen to believe that people of good faith of both political, political parties can still work together. And indeed, I would suggest to you the only lasting reform we're ever going to have is if, if it is bipartisan. Because if you have a partisan reform, 
Then when the next party comes into power, it's repealed. And a perfect example of that is the impartial justice law. I loved it, I thought it was great, but it had very little Republican support when it passed in the legislature. So bipartisan re uh, reform, I think, is the key. It'll take a while, but I think we can do it. The last thing is, you have to demand it. If you don't demand it, Donna and the other people in the legislature are not gonna hear it. It's not gonna be a priority. I know it is with her, but for many people it's not. So you have to make it a priority. You have to make clean, good, honest government transparency a priority. It's the only way reform will ever happen. And I am more optimistic than ever before, whether it was the Tea Party or now the other, the other side and the protests in Madison, more people are engaged in this stuff than has ever been the case before. So I actually am very optimistic about the future of Wisconsin. Of course, as a reformer, I have to be optimistic. Otherwise, I would kill myself. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Well, we're going to leave it there, er I think. Eric mentioned something earlier, and we haven't heard from you, and I realize you're the moderator. But Eric mentioned something earlier that sometimes the shining of the light of media transparency and those kinds of things can or does hinder the uh, ability of a government, a governmental body or legislative body to do the good, to do the work of, uh, of good government or of people. And I'm reminded of the effort when I was on the Board of Education to hire a new superintendent and there were some, some unintended consequences uh, when the names of all the applicants became known. And so whether it's uh, directly what Eric was talking about or in general, do you think that the media plays a sometimes detrimental role in this process? Um, you know, uh, of course not. Um, the, uh, the, I, guess, I guess the way that I, I see it as, um, you know, so we have this thing called CCAP in Wisconsin. Uh, and it makes a lot of information public about what happens in Wisconsin's courts, uh, including just, just today, somebody called me and um, was complaining that there was a, something on CCAP that was, it was a, a motion that was filed, a restraining order. It was never enforced. It was totally bogus. And why, why should it still be up there for the public to see? And, and the answer is there's a, there's a line in the, on the site that says this, this does not mean anything. You can't, don't hold this against anyone. Um, the answer to th th those cases where uh, transparency or disclosure causes problems, the, the solution is always more transparency. It's always more disclosure, M more discourse, and, and more talking about it. So, so, you know, I mean, I do think that, that uh, uh, media or a, a particular story, someone can, can make a mistake, somebody, a, a story can be spun in a way that is, um, that is sensational or something. The answer to that is to, for, for there to be more, more media sources, more stories, more people talking about it, and, and to let the, the full story come out. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's my best answer to that. Uh, I, think, I think we've gone quite long. I think we, better, we probably better wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Can I, one more. No, sure. Just uh, something, a uh, comment. Not to argue with uh, something Eric said, but to uh, <laughs> supplement it. Uh, community of interest. You were talking about dividing cities. Community of interest used to be the prevailing thing that was decided by the court, but uh, I mean decided in reapportionment, but then courts changed that to one person, one vote. And that's why we've uh, gotten uh, so many of the problems which, which allow uh, gerrymandering uh, in a terrible fashion. And uh, also uh, in congressional reapportionment, we never had problems with that. Those didn't go to the court because you know what happened? The congressmen in Washington, Republicans and Democrats, got together over a cocktails, <laughs> and they came up with a plan that they sent to the legislature, which we approved. The OB well, Sensenbrenner well, well, plans. Walter, the, the only thing I would disagree about is she has a change. the one person, <laughs> one vote rule was particularly instituted because people were being disenfranchised in the name of racial superiority and other issues using community as, as the, um, as the uh, me mechanism. Yeah. So it didn't necessarily replace, one person, one vote didn't create the gerrymandering, it created opportunities for people that didn't otherwise have honest representation. So I think we haven't completely, or shouldn't have completely gotten away from that. We just made it reform to work better for people. Thank you, Rob. Thanks everyone.
Thank you, Wausau. Appreciate it.